Good morning. Today we're in Jeremiah 1, 1 through 10. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Ananoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the king of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put, put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. How would you like to have been Jeremiah? A young person, maybe 14 years of age, they think, when God came to him and says, you get to be the voice that speaks to my people. Can you imagine a teenager going out and te speaking to a bunch of adults? Kind of, how would we treat a teenager who came out and started telling us, this is what's going to happen to you? Most of us wouldn't pay a bit of attention to them. You know, remember what I tell teenagers? When you're 12, year old, 12 years old, you have three brain cells. When you turn a teenager, you got two, and by the time you reach 17, you probably only got one functioning brain cell working, you know? And then until you get to about 21 that those brain cells start kicking back in. But Jeremiah has been called to do just that, to go as a young person to go out, you know, that had to have been a calling from God. There's no doubt about it because there isn't a young person today who would be wanting to step out and do just very that. Well, let's just take a review because after all, what is it we're looking forward to? His return. Actually, we're looking for him to come pick us up and take us, aren't we? The rapture, that's what we're looking for. So just a few things to help us remember. Before the tribulation or the rapture was going to occur, certain things had to take place. One of them was the restoration of the state of Israel. Has that happened? We know that's happened. We know that has actually happened. And if you remember, it talks about the fact it's going to happen in one day. In one day, that nation was formed. And if you remember on May 14th of 1948, Nine nations voted to make Israel a nation, and by the end of the day, the United States recognized Israel as a nation, and Israel became a nation in one day. Something nobody thought would possibly happen. We know that we have to look for things like this. Perilous times will come. Are we in perilous times now? We don't talk about the fact of all of the persecution that's going on in all the other countries that the news doesn't report of the thousands and thousands of Christians who are being persecuted this very day as it goes on. False pro Christ and false prophets will arise. Do we see that happening? Now, we say, oh, I don't see much of that going on, but go on YouTube. If you want to listen to all the predictions that are out there, 
People who tell you what's going to happen in 2020 and this and that, some of them come true, some of them don't, you know. Wars and rumors of wars, do we not hear that every day? And also, nations against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And what does it mean when it says kingdoms against kingdoms? Cultures. Cultures. Right now, what do we got? We got the black and white culture battle going on right now. You know, you guys are privileged white people. So, you know, and of course we all know this is not true, but this is what they're trying to propaganda out there for all of us. Famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, and did we not have another earthquake up by Stanley again this week? You know, I don't know if we felt it, but it was, uh, what? 4.2 this week. Not too far from where we were up camping once again. So, yes, these things are happening. Famines, we're going to see that happening. If you've been to Costco lately and looked around, or maybe even in the other stores, one thing I noticed about Costco, which I really is unusual, is they have a battery display that sits over here on this corner. All of a sudden, they got another battery display over here. All of a sudden, there's three displays of chips stuck throughout the store. What does that tell me? It tells me they're not having the products come in, and they're expanding out the stuff they got. You know? And... It seems funny because normally I've never seen them do these double and triple displays that we now see happening in Costco. This is coming. Famine. Pestilence we already deal with. Lawlessness and immorality will abound. Wow. All we got to do is look at Portland, don't we? Seventy some, close to 80 days now, they've rioted every night. You know? And they're going to... Yeah, I, I know. I'm sure there's one in there that's peaceful. Love of many will grow cold. Are you seeing that happening? Absolutely. We're seeing this all around us of people who I'm staying home. I don't care about my neighbor. Christians will depart from the faith giving heed to doctrines of demons. I talked to the lady from uh, Chosen People's Ministry this week. They call every once in a while just to call and talk to pastors and see how they're doing. And, of course, we're explaining to them, yeah, our church is only a third full like it normally is. And we're not seeing the young people showing up and, and all this stuff. And you know what she told me? That's common throughout the whole United States. The young people are not showing up at church. They're not supporting the churches. And she says, they go online. They can pick whatever sermon they want to listen to, and they don't feel like they need that fellowship together that's going on. And this is departing from the faith. I mean, we're seeing it happen all around us. And then you go through this definition, and it's, there's nothing to explain there. You guys see that all around us all along. You can look at, all you got to do is look at our government, and we can see exactly what's going on there. This is everything that we see here has to happen before the rapture, and it's happening today. Everything is coming together. So, when should the rapture happen? Right now. Right now. I'm voting in favor right now. I'm in favor of that. Let's go, you know? Yeah. Let's get this thing over with. But let's look at in the news. Prepare for crime surge. Hundreds of police departments, funding slashed. This is happening all over the United States, or all, actually all over the world. And it's happening on a massive scale, it's called. What is happening is nearly half of 258 agencies surveyed this month are reporting that funding has already been slashed or expected to be reduced, according to a report slated for release this week by the Police Executive Re Research Forum. Can you imagine that? We're reducing the funding of the police, and we've got better ideas to do with that money. There's so much more we can do. Most of it's coming from hiring and training accounts. Some of it's uh, letting police officers go and all that kind of stuff. It says, in most cases, we're not talking about small kids. Police funding in law challenges has reduced by how much? 
150 million dollars they've reduced the funding to the police. What does that mean? That means when you call for a police officer, he ain't going to show up. Police funding, you know, Eric, has been slashed by a total of one billion dollars. Yeah, you know, they're running into problems. It says in Seattle there's been a proposal to cut police funding by 50%, but apparently that wasn't good enough for some people. So now a measure has been introduced that would completely, what? Abolish the entire Seattle Police Department. Now, our, I think that's a good idea. Let's just get rid of them once and for all, right? And we're going to replace them with civilian-led Department of Community Safety and Violence Pre Prevention. And this is how the, he described it. Okay, the, they want to replace them with this nonprofit programs and community elect. So if you live in the Seattle area and you're concerned that in the future you may have any, not have anyone to call if someone breaks in your home, you can rest assured that someone will be on the end of the other end of the line when you call 911. But instead of a police officer with a gun responding to your call, you may have a community safety officer armed with science and reason compelling up to your place on his or her bike to perform a mental health evaluation of the individual you are having a disagreement with. So I'm disagreeing with that robber who just stole my TV set. We got to have a conversation, you two, you know? Can you imagine this is what we think the future should hold in store for us? They is exactly right. Don't fool you. This is coming to Boise, Idaho. That mayor will be part of this thing and the way she's going. Thankfully, our Napa mayor is, has not got that concept at all. She's a believer, and she definitely does not believe any of this stuff going on. But Boise, we see, is following the trend. You know, right now, it's only because there are people out there saying, you're not doing it in our city that are stopping it from happening. But if it's her choice, it would be happening right now. Bill Gates calls for national tracking system for coronavirus during Reddit Amana. So, he wants to track every person who has coronavirus and gets the shot. And of course, you are now aware of the fact that on your phone, this latest update has a coronavirus tracking system on it. So the moment you take that coronavirus shot, that shot will talk to your phone and they will notify them that you have had the shot and they will track you. But they don't want to track illegal immigrants they don't want to uh, track the thousands of criminals they have let loose during this coronavirus. They don't want to track any of those people. Who do they want to track? The law-abiding citizen, don't they? So there's much going on behind the scenes that we don't know on it. Riots and protests from Portland to Jerusalem. This is not a local event. This is not in the United States. It's happening all over the world, these protests. Netanyahu is, is, in Sunday school we talked a little bit just about, but Netanyahu is just as much under attack as Trump is. You know, they want to get rid of him. They're trying to put this. And of course, you know how the courthouse went. So, says the Israel protests are not as violent as their American peers, but their messages of hatred and Netanyahu are violent, and they have been some violent incidents which seem to be growing over the past week or so. Here's one. Lebanon, Hezbollah, and Israel all prepared to post explosive ramifications. says a day after enormous blast ripped through Beirut, and you all heard of that one, causing untold destruction, is still not possible to grasp the true scope of the calamity a former Israeli military intelligence chief was told. Analyze the incident led to explosion. Yadin said it started from a small explosion that looks like a fireworks storage facility, and then the big explosion came. He said, citing the 2,700 tons of reported ammonia nitrate stored in the warehouse at the port stock. See, and the interesting part about this, 
which they haven't told you about, is this is not the only warehouse they've found. That one went off. UK reported they found four warehouses full of ammonia nitrate. Germany has found one. Cyprus has found them. How many are in the United States, I keep asking? How many warehouses of ammonia nitrate do you think may be sitting around in our country? Because you just don't know where they're at. And of course, the interesting part, if you were in Sunday school, we talked about Beirut being destruction, and of course, the Bible prophecy of Isaiah 17 talking about Damascus being destro destroyed. And of course, when you read Isaiah 17, it says, Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. And the other part says it will never be a city again. What does that tell us? There's going to be some massive explosion to destroy that city. And this, this explosion that we saw in Beirut, you know, how many lives have been displaced from it? That port no longer exists, basically. It's been to totally destroyed. They'll have to tear the whole thing down to start over again to have that port back. And yet, that's what's going on. Israel's flag flown on Temple Mount. Let's give you some good news. Israel, the other day on Jerusalem Day, they have tried for every year to bring a flag in and fly it on the Temple Mount since 1967. 1967, the general that came in and conquered the Temple Mount brought a flag in. He put that flag up, and no sooner he put that flag up than he was told to take it down. You won't fly an Israeli flag on the Temple Mount. And every year since then, people have tried to bring in an Israeli flag to flow on that Temple Mount. And every year, it's been confiscated. But this year, it was different. He had the flag with him. He had it in his pocket. He went up there. They searched him like they always do. And the funny part was they ignored the flag. Well, that's unusual because they never do that. He went to the Temple Mount. He pulled out that flag, and he flew that flag. He should have been arrested, thrown in jail. Instead, the police officer comes up to him and says, would you just put that back in your pocket? Unheard of. That means a change of heart of the people on that Temple Mount. Things are changing there on it. But this is the first time a flag has been waved on that Temple Mount since 1967. And they didn't arrest him. They just told him to put it away. Amazing. So let's talk real briefly. If you were in Sunday school, you would have heard about some of the stuff we... We spent some time talking about today, but one of the things we talked about is, what are we looking forward to? The rapture, aren't we? So, and we talked about the fact, what are the things that have to happen before the rapture come? Israel needs to be a state. We talked about the fact that has happened, didn't it? May 14, 1948. We also talked about perilous times will come. Are we in perilous times now? False prophets, false Christ and false prophets will arise. And as we get into looking into the book of Jeremiah, we're going to see many of those false prophets in there too. But is that happening today? Absolutely. You can go on YouTube and read all kinds of false prophets that are coming up. Wars and rumors of wars. There isn't a day go by that we're not concerned about going to war somewhere. Or Israel being in war, you know. Israel's always prepared, nation against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and we ask, what does it mean when it says kingdom against kingdom? Culture against culture, and what is the war that we're fighting today in our own United States? It's the black and white culture, isn't it? And some people say that's not a war, but it is a war that's being fought in our own country right now. Famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, we all know about that. Lawlessness and immorality will abound. Do we not see that around us today? Everywhere we turn, every major city has lawlessness going on right now. Love of many will go cold. Christians will depart from the faith. And of course, men of lovers and all that. We've seen all of this stuff will happen. All of this needed to happen for the rapture. So is there anything stopping the rapture from happening? 
No, nothing. The rapture can happen right now. There's nothing biblically to stop the rapture. Now, there are things that need to slow down the tribulation. Those things, but we're not tied to the tribulation. Some people think we're tied to it, but we're not tied to it. We're only tied to the fact. Romans 11, 25. These are other things that will happen after the rapture. You know, rise of the Antichrist, false prophets, the ten nation conspiracy, all this stuff. But here's an interesting part. Why will we not be part of it, you ask yourself? You know, Romans 11.25 is this. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel. What's it say? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What does that mean? That means God has a specific number and he's waiting for that last person to accept Christ, and then everything can begin. So does that mean that the gospel has to be preached around the whole world? No. It just means that number has to be reached. We know that when the 144,000 go out from Israel, they will reach the whole world. The gospel will be preached to the whole world through them. But... We, as a Gentile, are waiting for the number of fulfillment to happen, which could happen at any moment. First, Second Thessalonians gives us even more of this. Is, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining it. You may be revealed in its own time. For the mystery of lawness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who has to be taken out of the way in order for the tribulation to go? Who is he? He is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be removed in order for this lawlessness, for devil, the evil one, to continue what he wants to accomplish. And then the lawless one will be revealed. And who is the lawless one? The Antichrist, right? Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we know that the Holy Spirit has to be departed before the lawless one can be revealed. Do we believe today that he is alive and well today? We do. We believe that he is on this earth somewhere fulfilling whatever it is he's doing to get prepared to take this position. The fact is, Joe was telling me the Pope is, would love that the prime, what is he, prime minister, whatever they call him, of France, President, France, Pre Martin. President of France, should be the one leading the world. You know? And of course, who's going to be the spiritual leader of that? Oh. He will, yeah. But Ephesians tells us this, in him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom you also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Where is the Holy Spirit? Right here. Can he leave you? No. Once he enters you and you've accepted Christ, he's there to stay. Now you may restrict him, allow him to do what he's been called to do. But how are you going to remove the Holy Spirit out of this world unless you remove the people? Exactly right. You have to remove the people to do that. Those souls have to be removed off this earth in order for the lawless one to come. So, when can the rapture happen? Any time. You know, when he calls that, the last start of the events are going to happen. Acts 15 says, Simon has declared how God at the first visit the Gentile to take out of them a people for himself, for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the temple of David. Tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. 
I will set it up so the rest of mankind will see, may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. So you see, when we come out of the world, when the Holy Spirit's taken out, the Temple Mount can come be built. The temple can be put back together again. So will we get to see the building of the temple? There's a good chance we won't get to see it. We just get to see everything that's being built up to it. You know? And of course, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the red heifer. So the question of Ezekiel 38. So, and of course, most of us know what Ezekiel 38. It's Magog and Gog. It's talking about Russia and Turkey and those, those countries in the north coming down and attacking Israel. Now, we expect that battle to happen before the tribulation. But the question we ask is, are we part of that? Do we, are we going to be here during Ezekiel 38? And where's Israel at this particular time? If you were to go to Israel today, would you say Israel is peaceful, safe, and secure? But Isaiah 38.8 tells us this. After many days you will be visited. In the latter days you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples on the mountain of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them, what? Dwells safely. That tells us that before the battle of Ezekiel, Israel has to have peace throughout the land. And they feel peace enough that if you read further on in Ezekiel 30, it tells us that they're an unwalled nation. You know, that means they're not having a defense. They're not concerned about the neighbors that are around them right now. But we know that's not the case. So that brings us to a question. How does Israel become a peaceful nation? Now, you know right now President Trump has a agreement he's working on. It's another so-called two-state solution, maybe a different approach to it this time, but he's working on that. And we know that every, the Bible tells us every time you come up with a two-state solution, your country will go into turmoil because God does not honor the two-state solution. And every time that our nation, every president has gone and tipped to Israel, to present the two-state solution, our country's gone back into turmoil. So, he's got to come up with a different plan. Somebody's got to come up with a different plan. But Psalms 83 gives us an insight of what is going to happen ahead of time. Now, we all know of Ezekiel 38, but there's another battle coming before Ezekiel 38. Psalms 83 tells us this. If you read down through here, for they have consulted together with one consent. Who is they? All the people around Israel. They form a confederacy against you. And what did they call it? The caliphate. It's usually what we know it as. It says the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, and Amalekak, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre, and you ask, put all this together, and what is it talking about? Look to here, this is present day Israel. We know that right now Israel has a conflict right here, the Golan Heights, don't we? What is Israel's plan right now? Annex the Golden Heights, isn't it? So they're going to do that. Then Yahoo says, I'm going to annex the Golden Heights in. Perfect. He needs to do that. What will that do for the Palestinians that there? Actually give them peace. It will actually allow them to have the freedom to move in and out of Israel as citizens of Israel, just like here at the Gaza Strip. But in order for all those other areas, when we look at those other areas, there's Edom, there's Moab, there's Ammon, there's the Armenians, here is, uh, right here is your Philistia, Amalek. You see this? In order for there to be peace in Israel, what has to happen? All that surrounding area has to be in peace. How is that going to get accomplished? And if you were in Sunday school, we talked about how that was going to get accomplished 
Because God tells Israel what they're supposed to do. How do you put peace in that whole surrounding area where Israel feels at peace? Deal with them, in verse 9, as with Midian. Remember the story in Numbers chapter 31? Moses is going out. These people attacked him, the Midianites. And what did God say to do to them? Wipe them out. So for Israel to have peace, Israel has to go and wipe them out. Have a war. So will we maybe see this war happen in the near future? Very possibly. That we will see Israel go in there and finally clear out all that area around them and finally bring peace peace to the area. And one of the things we know that's a hint of how devastating this is going to be is because Isaiah 17 tells us what? Because Damascus will cease from being a city and will be a ruinous heap, the cities of Aurora, Aurora also forsaken. That's the surrounding cities of Damascus. They will be for flocks which lie down and no one will make them afraid. So how do you take a city and destroy it? Well, I think Barut was a prime example that we got to see of what an explosion can do to a city, isn't it? What do they say? Hundreds are dead, thousands are wounded, and hundreds of thousands are misplaced. This is what can happen. Imagine, what do we know about Damascus? We know that during Saddam Hussein's reign, he brought in weapons of mass destruction into Damascus. Why is it every time Israel has to go and settle some matter and they go to Damascus and they send a plane in there to let off a bomb? They know exactly where that bomb's going ahead of time because the last thing they want to do is set off a weapon of mass destruction hid in that city somewhere. So that kind of gives you an idea of when's the rapture going to occur? Anytime. It can happen today, come Lord Jesus. But the tribulation still has a few things to go before it starts. You know, maybe we'll get to see some more of the stuff. But as we get into Jeremiah, Jeremiah being the next book in our line of our reading, he's known as the weeping prophet. Why is that? Because if you, once we get past Jeremiah, we get into the book of Lamentations. And we get to see the feelings of Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote Lamentations. He was a prophet to Judah. He was in the prophet in those last kings from Josiah on. He was in there. So he was a prophet to them. So this young man, 14, 15, 17 years old, has to go and talk to these people and tell them, this is what's coming to this nation. Can you imagine you are told and showed the devastation that's about to enter your nation and you try to go tell people of it and guess what? Nobody will listen to you. Nobody will listen to you. Fact is, he went all the way through it. When the Babylonians came in and captured him, he was in prison at the time. Nebuchadnezzar took him out of prison but didn't send him to Babylon. He left in there, and so what happened? Raiders came in and took him to Egypt, and that's where he died, you know. But this poor guy got to see all the devastation and destruction that Isaiah had warned about, you know, 70 years earlier. Isaiah had told him this is what's going to happen, and now he is the one who went through it. He never was allowed to marry. His family deserted him. And as you read through there, through there, you found out he's been whipped. He was put in stocks, attacked by mobs, threatened by king, ridiculed, beaten, accused of treason, thrown in jail, and was even thrown in a deep well at one time to try to get rid of him because they did not want to hear what he had to say. But in the end, he told them, you're going to be in Israel or in Babylon 70 years, so you might as well build your house and settle in because it's not going to do you any good to try to complain and fight this because this is what's going to happen. So, Jeremiah tried to save the city from Babylon, but he failed. How's that for a career you'd like to have? 
The kingdom of the ten northern tribes, Israel, or Babylon, had already fallen. I should say Israel had already fallen by the time of Jeremiah's prophecies, which means Israel had already been taken by Assyria, and they've already been there for close to 100 years. Much of Judah was already in the hands of Babylon. During this time, the kings, if you look at those last few kings that were picked, they weren't picked by the people of Israel. They weren't even picked by God. They were picked by the Babylonian Empire. They were told, you're the next line and king. And when it, when it finally came down to that, what was left was just the city. That was the only free thing that was left in there. Jeremiah, like Isaiah, carried a message of condemnation to Apostle Israel. He was a mild and gentle man, not like Isaiah, which was bold and brought out tear, a fire, I guess you'd say. Chapter 46 to 51 talks about judgment against the nation, especially Babylon. What's going to happen after this 70 years goes on? Uh, he lived with the reign of seven kings that we talked about on it. And who was it that was at the time? Assyria was one of the world powers, Babylon, and of course Egypt was in there also. But this is what Jeremiah stated. It says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He has been speaking about all the devastation. God says, this is the words I want you to speak. And Jeremiah decides one day, I'm just not going to talk about God anymore. I'm tired of this. It is a terrible struggle for me. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary and forbearing. And what did he say? And I could not stay. It says, as much as I did not want to teach destruction that was coming on this land, I had no choice. God had put it in my heart. I had to share it. So he continued to preach as the thing on went on. The drought, in chapters 14, 15, we'll read of the drought. The message of the linen cloth. I don't know if you remember, as you read through here, you're going to get into chapter 13. You're going to read about the linen cloth that God told him to go buy and God told him to go bury it. And the purpose behind the lesson that came with that on it. Chapters 30 and 31 are the song of restoration. And in that, it also tells us about the tribulation. So here is even prophecy of the future that's going to be happening in there. So there is a lot to read on it. So we could read back through there, but you guys kind of get an idea that the part here that we want to look at is this. Do not say I was only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I put my words in your mouth. See, today I have appointed you over nation and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. How would you like to have that as your calling from God? To go and tell the world of what the destruction is coming up ahead. And then as you read on through there, you'll get to see that God... Give him examples to make sure that he was actually listening to what God had to say on it. So, could God call you to be his mouthpiece in this time? You think so? Maybe you don't think so. But if God plants that in you, what choice do you have? None. You have to share the message of what's coming up ahead on it. And we're going to see more and more of that happening. When it talks about the old man had dreams, young men will prophesy, we're seeing that happening today. But how did Jeremiah overcome it? He overcome it by spending time in the Lord. In his prayers, as you read through Lamentations, and these other stuff. You'll get to know Jeremiah. And next week we'll look into some of Jeremiah and what's going on with him. But a young man, 14 to 17 years old, has given his marching orders that I want you to share with your country what's going to happen. And while he's sharing it, this stuff is happening. 
He's not talking the future. He's telling them what's presently going to happen. And they did not believe him. They would not heed his warning. That must have been really sad for him. It's sad for all of us when that kind of stuff goes on. You know, older people can tell younger people, don't do this because we have been through it before. But when a young person tells an older person, don't do this, most of the time they ignore them, don't they? Because they say, kid, you ain't been where I've been. But Jeremiah was called from God. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that what a life Jeremiah must have been had. A burden you laid up on him to tell him of the coming doom and a greater burden to know that they're not going to listen to you. That everything you do is going to fail. And you can see at times the depression that Jeremiah went through to, to, to struggle through this, Lord. But we know that he was faithful to you. In spite of all this, he did what you asked him to do, and that nation was warned. But they didn't listen. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for the people that have warned our country of the, what's coming up ahead, of, of what to expect. And yet we see this nation does not listen. They are not turning back to you. Sometimes we think they're fleeing from you. Lord, we just pray that you allow each and every one of us here to be faithful to you. We pray that if, when the opportunity comes to share your message, Lord, that maybe we'll be the one that leads that last person and brings the rapture and better yet, brings an end to all of this turmoil. So we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been given the Great Commission. Go into all, all the world and give the message to every creature. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by sight by faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by god's own hand a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw a day When the longed-for Messiah would appear With the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost To deliver captives and to preach good news 
in every corner of the world. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our souls reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who call upon his name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our souls reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. That's what we will do. Dear Lord, give us strength that we can do these things and honor you as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.